tell you about. It isn't a pleasant one, and some of you might not even want to hear it. But we feel as a family there's not enough people that are telling the other people what can happen to you when you allow yourself to become defenseless. So uh, the girls don't mind. They, they will tell you themselves. And we've come to grips with this, that the best way to prevent this from happening is to tell other people what happened to us and how it happened to us. So I'm going to tell you that. If you don't want to hear it, just put your fingers over your ears. Uh, August 23rd, 2000 began as most other summer mornings in a rural home. John and Tiffany Carpenter in Mercy, California. This is my son and daughter-in-law. John left for work at about 6 a.m. After waking two of the girls, Tiffany left for an 8 a.m. appointment to have the brake service on the family van. Little did she know that when she returned, just two short hours later, the house would be surrounded by yellow crime scene tape. Two of her children would be brutally stabbed to death with a pitchfork, and another seriously wounded. Their killer was a 27-year-old white male, approximately 6 foot 2 and weighing between 235 and 250 pounds. He was well known to law enforcement and the court system. He was a parolee with a history of drug abuse. He had already violated enough laws to lock him up for years. His most serious crime happened while working as an actor in Los Angeles, California in 1997. At that time, he forced his wife and infant son into his car at gunpoint. He drove around for about three hours before she managed to escape from a little town in Mojave, California. Though she reported to the police and kept checking on the case, as far as she knew, there was never any investigation. After that, there were several incidents where he was arrested by the police, including some time spent in a mental institution in Las Vegas, Nevada, for creating a disturbance in the mall. He became involved in satanic worship and had a fetish for horror movies especially a series called Halloween, ironically produced by a John Carpenter. The one he especially liked had a scene depicting a murder done with a pitchfork. Fearing for her life, his wife divorced him. When she remarried, he began calling her house and leaving threatening messages on her answering machine. Though she gave the tape to the Doss House, California Police Department, and kept, again, kept checking on it, as far as she knew, there was never any investigation. These are things that she told the police. About two years ago, while under the influence of drug and alcohol, he drove his car down a one-way street in San Francisco, California, and crashed head-on into a taxi. Though he assaulted the police officers who tried to arrest him, he was later released. We were told by the Merced Police Department that his most recent arrest was in Merced on drug charges, for which he was released because of jail overcrowding. In an effort to comply with California's safe storage laws, my son did not leave his guns and ammunition accessible to his children, even when his 14-year-old was babysitting. Though he had schooled all of his children in safe gun handling, he was more afraid of the law than he was of the assailant. Sadly, in reality, the big bad wolf does not walk up to your door and knock on it and say, I'm going to have him puff if you don't let me in and I'm going to blow your house down. He doesn't do that. He comes sneaking in your garage not expecting him, and he hides in there where the neighbors can't see him, and he gives the lock on your door with a butter knife. That's what he did in their house. At that time, your only defense is going to be quick access to a gun, not one we have to unlock. Though my 14-year-old granddaughter had been trained to shoot when she entered the kitchen and saw this stranger standing naked in her living room with all the visible windows barricaded with furniture, she could do nothing but hurry back to her bedroom and lock the door. She had a phone in her room. When she tried to use it, it wouldn't work. The killer had disconnected it. She knew her only hope of saving her siblings from possible harm was escaping out her window and running for the help of a neighbor. Hearing a loud noise, my 13-year-old granddaughter opened her bedroom door. Thinking one of the younger children had broken something, she saw a half-naked man standing in the hallway peering into her nine-year-old sister's bedroom. As he turned toward her, leveling a pitchfork at her in a threatening manner, she nudged her 11-year-old sister behind her. Retreating to the far side of the bed, her 11-year-old sister was helpless to do anything but watch in horror as he picked her up by one arm and flung her onto the bed like a rag doll. 
When he began stabbing her repeatedly with a fork, both of them knew their only hope was if one of them could get to their dad's gun. Stop that! Leave my sisters alone! Tragically, these words are forever branded in the minds of 13-year-old Anna and 11-year-old Vanessa, for they are some of the last words they heard their little sister say. As nine-year-old Ashley slowly backed the man across the hallway from her sisters, Anna staggered from the room. The door to her mom and dad's room was closed and there was no sound from inside. The killer had his back to her, his head only inches away, but even as she knew it was in her power to save her sisters with her dad's gun, she also knew it to be impossibly out of her reach. When nine-year-old Ashley dove for the man's legs, Anna could do nothing but helplessly watch as he tossed her against the wall by her bookcase. Bleeding profusely from over 14 stab wounds, Anna knew she could do nothing but try to get help. Thinking how easy it would be to save her sister if she could only get to her dad's gun, 11-year-old Vanessa glanced about for anything else she might use for a weapon. Ashley was again grappling for the man's legs. And this time, Vanessa saw him sling her hard against the wall. As he did, he drew back the pitchfork and stabbed her in the chest. With a strength born of desperation, Ashley pushed off the wall. Again diving for le his legs, she wrapped her own arms and legs about his. When he trapped her head between his knees, she looked up at Vanessa and waved a bleeding hand for her to go. Knowing there was nothing else she could do, Vanessa ran from the room. Go, 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 Vanessa heard Ashley screaming as she leaped across the furniture the killer had used to barricade the hallway. Looking over her shoulder, she saw the man coming down the hallway after them, a pitchfork in his hand. Finding the furniture piled against all the doors and windows, they had no place left to go except down the hall past Jessica's room. He's killed Jessica too, Vanessa started crying, but they had no time to stop and try her door. The laundry room and the door leading into the garage was all they had left. As they rounded the corner of the L-shaped hall beyond Jessica's door, they saw the heavy oak bookcase full of books blocking both remaining doors. Seeing a small gap where the bookcase did not quite reach the wall, Vanessa forced herself through it. Anna was not so lucky. Being larger than Vanessa, she could not get through. With the burst of superhuman strength, Vanessa grasped her arm and yanked her through, just as the man grabbed for her leg. He had wedged a kitchen chair beneath the knob of the door, exiting into the garage so they could not get it open. Only the laundry room door was left. Thankfully, it did not have a lock on it and opened into the room instead of the hall. Rushing inside, Vanessa slammed the door shut behind them. Leaning upon it, she heard the killer pleading for them to let him in as she watched Anna open the window and climb outside. Finding no one at home at the first house she had fled to, Jessica was racing toward the second house when she saw two of her sisters limping across the field toward her. Do you have a gun, Anna asked, when this neighbor let her in. This is the first thing Anna asked me. Yes, the man replied. Can you take it and save my sister and brother, she begged him. There is a crazy man in our house stabbing them to death with a pitchfork. It is only to protect my home, own home, he replied. If I take it out of my house, they will take it away from me. Because of laws that pretend to protect children, we have lost two. Even the neighbor was so afraid of the law, he refused my granddaughter's plea. <coughs> because lawmakers think they know more about gun safety than their parents, 14-year-old Jessica had nothing with which to defend her brother and sisters on that tragic day. When the dispatcher took her 911 call, it had been 14 short, short minutes since she had entered the kitchen and looked at the clock. Self-defense is a basic God-given instinct for using the only weapon our legislators consider her mentally capable of. Our brave little Ashley suffered 138 stab wounds, most of them in her head, face, area. The children never saw John William. The police told us he was killed in his sleep in his mom and dad's bed. He had a total of 46 stab wounds in the head and body. No one had the right to deny my grandchildren whatever weapon they needed to defend themselves from this crazed killer that brazenly broke, in, broke into the sanctity of their own home. How long will we continue to tolerate laws that prosecute the just and allow the criminal to consistently go free? 
This killer had no fear of the justice system. When the police demanded that he lay down his weapon, he laughed at them. Please don't forget the carpenter's story. If you do, it may happen to you. I would have never thought it could happen to me, but it did. And it does happen to people that are minding their own business.